The Peter Schiff Show. Well, the Dow finished out the last trading day of February, elongated by the February 29th leap year with a 123-point decline. In fact, the Dow Jones closed at the low of the day. The Nasdaq was down 32 and a half points. Gold reversed the decline that happened on Friday. Gold was down about 12 bucks on Friday. It was up 16 and a half dollars today. It's up another two and a half dollars as I'm recording it here this evening. We're now back above 1240 on the price of gold. In fact, the reason the price of gold declined on Friday was that the rate hike was apparently back on the table because we got some stronger than expected GDP numbers for the fourth quarter of last year. And also the consumer income and spending numbers were a little hotter. Now, remember, I was thinking that they would revise down the fourth quarter GDP from up 0.7, which they originally reported, to up something lower. In fact, the consensus was for a downward revision to up just 0.4. And I thought the consensus was probably a little optimistic. And as it turned out, the government moved it up to up plus one. And the reason was apparently that the inventories were not drawn down or liquidated as much as was originally thought. So I suppose that's going to happen in Q1 of 2016 rather than Q4 of 2015. In fact, Atlanta GDP has already walked down their estimate for Q1 a bit since uh, that number came out, although I still think they are way too optimistic. In fact, I don't even think it really matters what the government says GDP was for the fourth quarter, because I think before the year is over, they're going to revise that quarter negative because they're going to have to admit that the recession began last quarter. And this is exactly what they do. They always declare a recession after the fact by going back and revising down the data. That is exactly how they did it last time. And that's how I think they're going to do it this time. We got the trade deficit in merchandise that actually came out bigger than expected for January, 62.2 billion versus 61 billion. That's a lot of red ink for merchandise trade in one month. That was worse than expected. What also spooked the gold market was the income and spending numbers a little bit hotter than anticipated. Uh, personal income up 0.5 versus 0.4 expectations. Spending also up 0.5 versus 0.3. But the core CPE numbers, the inflation numbers, were hotter also. Instead of being unchanged for the month, we were up 0.1. And year over year, we were up uh, 1.7 on the core and 1.3 uh, overall, which were higher than they were looking for. And so it was the idea that, well, the economy is a little bit stronger than we thought. Inflation is a little bit higher. The rate hikes are back on the table. I don't think so. I don't think there's any way that that's what's on the table, especially when you look at the horrible, horrible numbers that came out today. First one is the Chicago PMI for February. Last month was 55.6. People were looking for 52.9. We got 47.6, one of the worst prints since the Great Recession. In fact, if you look at some of the subcomponents, including employment, this was the weakest um, Chicago PMI since 2009. What was going on in 2009? We were going the Great Recession of 2009. Also, pending home sales. They were looking for an increase of 0.5 following the move up for the prior month, which they did revise up to 0.9, but we actually got a print of minus 2.5. That was the biggest drop in pending home sales in two years. And that happened despite mild weather in January in uh, the Northeast, which should have helped. And also it happens, of course, despite record low mortgage rates that we've got now. Uh, the problem is affordability. Prices are too high and incomes are too low. You just can't afford to buy a house on a part-time minimum wage job. That is the reality that nobody wants to admit to. Also, the Dallas Fed manufacturing 
Uh, another negative print. I don't know how many months in a row uh, this has been. Uh, last month was negative 10.2. This month was act was negative 8.5. So a little bit less negative than before. I don't know what the consensus was, but it was another bad number. Uh, but that Chicago PMI number, that was awful. So anybody who was looking at the data on Friday and thinking, aha, things are getting better, they're not. And believe me, even a 1% GDP, even if that is the number for the fourth quarter, that is a very, very weak number, especially considering the Fed raised interest rates. So if the economy was struggling with 0% rates, well, how much more difficult is it going to be for the economy to advance, given now that rates are higher and theoretically going to go up even more because the Fed is still pretending that the economy or the recovery is on track and that rate hikes still might come even in in uh, in March, which I think the possibility there is extremely slim. We'll get a little bit more information today. It's a pretty data heavy week. This is a jobs week. I mean, it came by pretty quick because of the shorter uh, February month. But we are going to get the employment situation on Friday, the, the big non-farm payroll number. And we're also going to get the January trade deficit, which I think are two important numbers. The markets don't seem to pay too much attention to the trade deficit these days, but I think it's important. But we're going to get that. We also get ISM manufacturing tomorrow. So there are some bigger numbers coming out later in the week that could tell the story. But meanwhile, while the stock market was closing on the low of the day, gold closed on the high of the day, gold stocks closed on the high of the day. So these trends are continuing despite that brief interruption on, on Friday. In fact, you know what I think is the most significant part of today's trading was oil. Oil prices rose. In fact, they closed on the high of the day up over a dollar at I think around thirty three ninety, just below thirty four dollars a barrel. That despite the sell off in the stock market. So I think everybody on CNBC was kind of scratching their heads because this is kind of perplexing them because, hey, this was all about oil, right? Oil going down means stocks going down. Well, why didn't the stock market rally with the rise in the price of oil. And I think eventually this link is going to completely break once the dollar starts to go down. Because once the dollar really rolls over, I think you're going to see oil prices rising and stock prices falling. Because higher oil prices is bad for the U.S. economy because it's bad for the consumer. It increases the cost of living and it decreases disposable income. I mean, there is a benefit right now. Consumers are benefiting from cheap gas. You just can't see it because... The, the cheap gas, the benefit from cheap gas is being uh, overrun by the negatives of higher rent and higher uh, utilities and higher food and higher health care, all that stuff. But when oil and gasoline start to rise along with everything else, then it's just going to make a weak economy that much weaker. I want to comment, though, about an interview I heard this morning from Warren Buffett, because, you know, Berkshire Hathaway is out. He's got his annual shareholder letter out. So, you know, he's doing his dog and pony show. He's going on CNBC or Fox and, you know, talking to all the reporters like he likes to do. And they were asking him a bunch of questions, but two in particular, when they got to politics, right, they're asking him about Bernie Sanders and, and, and Donald Trump. And he basically is saying that he disagrees with most of what Bernie Sanders is saying. And he wanted to talk mainly about, you know, some of the changes that Bernie Sanders thinks he wants to make to our system. And he's basically saying, look, you know, why kill the goose that lays the golden eggs? He just doesn't understand a few things. And in fact, he, he took a, a jab at Donald Trump and his Make America Great because he said, look, we don't have to make America great. It is great. It never stopped being great. In fact, it's the greatest it's ever been. And that's what I want to talk about is... Warren Buffett's contention that America, and as measured by the standard of living of Americans, is the greatest it's ever been. This is what Warren Buffett said. It is complete nonsense. And what he said to try to prove it is he said that his neighbors, where he lives in, uh, in Omaha, and he lives in a middle-class neighborhood, and he says, you know, the average household income in Warren Buffett's neighborhood. Remember, this guy is worth, what, $40, $50 billion, right? But apparently, the average income in his neighborhood is about $100,000, right? Middle class, middle America. That's where Warren Buffett lives. And he's a simple man, so, I mean, I'm not, there's nothing against that. But he said that his neighbors live better today 
than John D. Rockefeller did. John D. Rockefeller. He was the wealthiest American of his day. In fact, if you adjust it for inflation, he is wealthier than anybody alive today. Not just in America, in the world. By a factor of maybe three. That's how rich John D. Rockefeller was. Yet according to Warren Buffett, the average middle-class American, not the average wealthy American, the average middle-class household earning $100,000 a year, they're living better than John D. Rockefeller. I'm not making this up. He said it. This is complete hogwash. And specifically, he referenced a few things. Like he said, health care. And he says that, you know, they have better health care than John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller died at the age of 97. So how much longer would he have lived had he been alive today with our health care? I mean, would he have lived that much longer than 97? Maybe. But most Americans who are middle class alive today, even my age, I'm 52. My life expectancy is not 97. So John Rockefeller did pretty darn good with the health care that we had 100 years ago. So obviously, he in particular didn't suffer because he didn't have modern medicine. I'm not saying we haven't had advancements in modern medicine. It's not because of the government. It's despite the government. But John Rockefeller himself did pretty good living to age 97. Now, he also talked about entertainment. He said, well, you know, middle class Americans today have much better entertainment than John D. Rockefeller. Well, I mean, John D. Rockefeller didn't have Netflix, right? I mean, he didn't even have television, right? He died in 1937. Uh, so by the time he died, I mean, they didn't have television, but they had radio. Certainly he had movies. He went to the theater uh, for the last uh, you know, third of his life. But you're telling me that John D. Rockefeller was bored living in the, the gay 90s, the 1890s or 1900s? He lived through the roaring 20s? You think this guy had nothing to do? I mean, you think... Life is all about sitting home and watching Netflix. I mean, this was the richest man in the world. And, and uh, uh, Warren Buffett thinks the guy was bored. I mean, what about actually going out? What about live theater? What about that? I mean, how many Americans have enough money to buy a ticket to a, to, to, to a theater? But what about the symphony or the opera or the ballet? What about just going out? He went out to dinners. He went out to lavish parties. He, had, he saw concerts, big bands entertaining him. I mean, you're telling me you think this guy was bored? The richest man in the world? I mean, if he even had Netflix, he probably wouldn't have even watched it. He would have had better things to do. I'm not saying that Netflix isn't good or cable television or the Internet. But to say that a guy lives better than John D. Rockefeller did because he has those things? I mean, come on. I mean, that is absolutely ridiculous to say that. Now, you say, well, yeah, we have air conditioning today. And John Rockefeller probably didn't have air conditioning. Yeah, but so what? You think he spent his summers in, you know, in, in, in Manhattan? No, he was on the beach in the Hamptons or everywhere or on his yacht. You think this guy was really hot? No. I mean, these wealthy people, certainly like John Rockefeller, they summered in places that were cool in the winter, right? Or in the winter, they went to certain places. They traveled around. They had plenty of money. You know, so this is absurd. Now, maybe if Warren Buffett wanted to say that the middle class Americans today have a better living standard than like some medieval king, right? I mean, that I would say yes, right? Would, I mean, because I would certainly rather be John D. Rockefeller living from, uh, you know, 1830, 1840, 1840-ish, I guess he was born, to 1937. I would have rather been John David Rockefeller and lived his life than being a middle-class American today. But I think I would rather be a middle-class American or even a middle-class European, for that matter, than, you know, king of some country in 700, 800 AD, you know, some, you know, Essex or, you know, wherever some, you know, in, in what's now Great Britain somewhere to be some king, right? There, that would make sense if you wanted to talk about that, because now we've had a lot more advancements. But to go back to America, really in its heyday, in its glory days, and to say to be the wealthiest person then, you know, you didn't have good health care, you were bored, uh, is, is complete nonsense. But what I also want to talk about is just looking at the middle class, because for Warren Buffett to say that even the middle class, that this is the best we've ever done, this is the heyday of America, this is the greatest we've ever been, is hogwash. I would say that the epitome of the American middle class was probably the 1950s, that it started going downhill in the 1960s. But we topped out in the 1950s, and that 
the standard of living of middle class American families was higher in the 1950s than it is today. Now, does that mean that I don't think there's been any technological advancements since then? Of course not. There has been. But despite that, the average American middle class family doesn't live as well. Even with that technology, they don't live as well as Americans did in the 1950s, nor do I believe that they're as happy. Right? Yes, they, they have a few fancy things, but overall, the, they, they're in worse shape. I mean, t think about it this way. What about the typical woman in a middle class household today? She's got a job, maybe two. She's working 40 hours a week right, outside the home. In the 1950s, middle class women didn't have to work outside the home. If, unless, you know, most of them didn't want to. In fact, a lot of the women that are working today don't want to, but they no longer have the choice. Women in the 1950s had the choice not to go to work. Most women today don't have that choice. If they're middle class, they have to work because their husband can't afford to support them. Also, they can't have as many children as they would like. Most women that have one child, maybe two, they, they prefer to have three or four. They can't afford it. And they can't juggle all those kids and a job at the same time, right? So you have all these women that have to work that didn't have to work before. And of course, I think middle-class women, certainly, you know, upper middle-class women uh, had more help around the house in the 1950s. More middle-class households had live-in help, live-in housekeepers or part-time housekeepers than they have today. So they didn't spend all their days cooking and cleaning. Uh, you know, maybe if you were married to a blue-collar guy, Right? Then you did. But if, you're, if your husband wore a suit to work, chances are you weren't doing all the housework. You had a housekeeper. You spent you know, your days at the PTA or doing some charity work. Maybe you cooked dinner or maybe you and your husband went out for dinner. Right? You, you went out uh, to, to a nice dinner. You heard, heard music, went to a show. I mean, most people today, married couples, they don't go out. They don't have nightclubs anymore like they did in the 1950s. I mean, the people that go to clubs now are kids. Because they don't have jobs, they're in school, they don't have families to support, they don't have work. They go out, they go out to bars and clubs. Married couples, rarely. Yeah, they sit home and watch Netflix because they're too pooped. Especially when the guy, the husband now, who used to have a wife, he would come home to his house and his wife was there and the meal was maybe ready and the home was all taken care of. Now the guy comes home from work. Maybe he doesn't even beat his wife home. Maybe he gets home first. He's got to start helping with the cooking and, and taking care of the kids. Eat their beat. By the time they're finished with dinner, no one has any energy to go out like they used to go out back then. So the entire American way of life has gone down dramatically. Yes, we, you know, we do have fancier things, but you know, do we have any more enjoyment? I mean, even if you go back when my dad was a kid uh, growing up during the Depression, they didn't have television yet. He listened to radio and all of his friends listened to the radio. They listened to the long ranger, or whatever they listened to. And my, you know, my dad tells me stories about how much he loved just sitting in a room and staring at a box and listening to that radio. Now, you know, do, do I think that my dad had any less enjoyment from the radio than my kids today have from television or the internet? I don't think so. Because, you know, you, you, you know what you know. I mean, you're used to it. Now, would somebody listen to the radio today, given the fact that there is a television set? Of course not. I mean, if my father had a TV set in the 1930s, he'd have watched that. But that doesn't mean he didn't enjoy what he did have. It's just that he didn't know anything else. So people still enjoyed themselves in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, even though the entertainment by today's standards, when you turned on television, wasn't as good, but I think the um, the number of people who enjoyed live entertainment, you know, was much higher back then than it is today. Most people can't afford it, and so they have to settle for watching a screen. But there is there is a lot to be said from live theater, li live or orchestras, concerts, things like that, that people went to a lot more frequently back then uh, because they actually had more after tax income, more wealth. And the other big problem is that. Even though I believe that our standard of living is lower today for middle class Americans than it was in the 1950s, and I think measurably lower, we can't even afford it because we're borrowing money to maintain this standard of living. I mean, imagine where the typical U.S. household would be if they weren't going into debt. Back in the 1950s, Americans had a higher standard of living and they can actually afford it. They didn't have to put it on the credit card. They weren't all levered up. As the typical American 
uh, in the 1950s had a job and he was supporting his wife, he was saving for his retirement. He was building up. Today, a guy has a job. He can't afford to support his wife. His wife's got a full-time job too. And between the two of them, they can't save anything. And they're going into debt. They've mortgaged up their house. Maybe they have student loans. They got credit card debt. They got loans on their cars. I mean, this is a huge disaster waiting to happen. So if you think the typical American is struggling today, wait till you see what's going to happen when the bill comes due for this gigantic party. Because we were paying cash in the 1950s. We can afford that leave it to beaver lifestyle. Now, whatever it is we got now, we can't afford it. Another important point, though, that Buffett is overlooking is the relative difference between the standard of living of Americans versus the rest of the world. Because if you go back to the 1950s, the way the American middle class lived, nobody anywhere else in the world could come anywhere close. I mean, to the extent that you even would call what they had in Europe or South America or Asia a middle class, whatever they had, it paled in comparison to what Americans were living like during that same time period. Right. That is the time period that gave way to the term the ugly American when you had, you know, a school teacher or a bus driver or, you know, taking a vacation in Europe and, you know, living, living it up because everybody made so little relative to what we were able to earn. And we had our dollars went so far. That's where they had the, you know, the book uh, Europe on five dollars a day because it was very inexpensive for middle class Americans to uh, to travel around Europe because things were so inexpensive. So if you take a look at how much higher our standard of living was in the 1950s relative to the standard of living in other countries, and now compare it today, because today there are many countries in the world where the standard of living is higher than it is in the United States. And there's certainly plenty of countries where it's similar. Maybe it's a little bit lower, a little bit higher, but pretty close. But in 1950, nobody could come anywhere near it wasn't even a close call. We were so much higher than any place else. And for the fact or the fact that so many other nations have caught up and that some of them have even passed us, you have to ask yourself, why? How did we blow such a big lead? And the reason we blew it is because we abandoned all the prison, all the principles that let us get so far ahead in the first place. We went from limited government free markets to central planning, central banking, war on poverty, all the things that the government did to supposedly make our lives better backfired and made them worse. And if it wasn't for all the technology that we created, despite all the things that government were doing, imagine how much more difficult life would be if we had today's uh, lack of freedom with 1950s technology. Right? The best, of course, would be if we still had the freedom of the past but the technology of today. In fact, if we still had the freedom of the past, today's technology would be a lot greater because we would have been even more innovative had we had less government. Let's go from the sublime to the ridiculous here and, and talk about the Oscars, last night's Academy Awards. And the big thing about the Academy Awards is all the controversy surrounding the fact that there weren't any African-American nominees in the acting categories this year. And apparently, I guess there weren't any last year either. So it was two years in a row. And this shows that the Academy is racist, right? And that was the whole thing. Despite the fact that Chris Rock uh, was the MC who happens to be black, the Academy is racist. And of course, his entire monologue was all about how racist the Academy was. And so apparently, too, there were some black Actresses, I think Jada Pinkett Smith was boycotting the Oscars because there were no black nominees. And they were talking about Oscars so white was this big, I think, a Twitter hashtag. And uh, Chris Rock said, you know, yes, uh, this was welcome to the Oscars. This is the White People's Choice Awards. Big all this stuff about how uh, Hollywood is so discriminating or the Academy. Meanwhile, these guys are as left as you can get. I mean, I'm sure that if you went to the uh, Academy, these guys are voting 90 percent Democrats, right? They're, they're as left as you can be when you come to the Motion Pictures Academy. So to say that they are racist, I mean, almost and I almost like it because it's like a little bit of what's good for the goose is good for the gander because they're always accusing people. Hollywood's accusing everybody else of being racist and they're wrong. They're not. But then when it gets turned on themselves and now they're being accused of the same thing, you know, they're in a difficult position, right? You know, because what are they going to do? 
Right now, they're having to uh, sleep in their own bed. But here's the joke of it is. If you look at the Oscar nominations that blacks have, there is no way that you can say that there's any racism, even on the theory of disparate impact, right? Because there's no way that the Academy members are deliberately not nominating or voting for blacks. They're just not doing that. But if it turns out that for some reason blacks are not getting nominated or they're not winning awards, it's not because they're black. It's because of the roles that they're in or the performances that they gave. They are not judging it based on their ethnicity. They are, I think it has nothing to do with it. But the protesters are saying, hey, there's no black nominees, therefore there must be racism. Well, let's look at the facts. And by the way, too, because blacks, African-Americans, are about 12.2% of the population. Hispanics, on the other hand, are 16.3% of the population, and Asians are 4.7%. So if you add those two together, that's 21% of the population, right? Blacks are the only ones that are protesting that they haven't been nominated, and uh, Asians and Hispanics are not. And the reason I bring this back, bring this up, is if you go back in history, there are a lot of black people uh, who have been nominated for Academy Awards, and there's been a lot who have won. But if you look at Asian Americans, or Asians, not just Asians, not just Asian Americans, but Asians, and you go back all the way to the, the beginning, right, of the Oscars in the 1930s, there's only been two Asian men who have been, have been nominated for Best Actor. Two! Two in history! And guess who they were? Yul Brynner and Ben Kingsley. Now, you might not even know that they're Asian because they certainly don't look Asian. But there's no actual Chinese or Japanese. Nobody that actually looks Asian has been nominated for or won an Academy Award Best, Best, uh, Best Actor. There's been one woman, one woman of Asian descent that won an Academy Award. 1935. Merle Oberon. Merle Oberon won 1935. Go Google Merle Oberman, and look at her picture, and you tell me if she looks Asian. I mean, she's almost as white as anybody else. That's the only woman, woman to win uh, best, best Actress ever, ever in the history of the Academy. Look at Hispanics. You know, Hispanics, there's been one person who has won uh, Best Actor in a supporting role. Oh, no, leading, here, leading. Uh, leading out 1988. Edward James Olmos, stand and deliver, right? He was nominated, didn't win, nominated. That's the only Hispanic to ever be nominated for Best Actor in the history of the Academy Awards, and he didn't win. And Best Supporting Actor, there was one person uh, nominated, 1947, didn't win, nominated Thomas Gomez. That's it. Then you got a few nominees for Supporting Actress. Uh, that's it. No, I mean, I mean, and no best actress, not a single Hispanic, not a single one nominated for best actress in the history of the Academy, in the history of the Academy, despite the fact that they're 16.3% of the population, not a single one, yet nobody of Hispanic descent is protesting or boycotting. Look, I did a few numbers going back to 2000, because I don't want to go all the way back to the first Academy Awards. Just go back for the last 16 years, since 2000. Here are the facts. Okay, for the best actor category, 12.5% of the nominations have been black. 12.5%. They're 12.2% of the population. They got 12.5% of the nominations. I mean, that, that seems right. Get this. They won 18.75% of the Academy Awards. That's more than their population. In fact, what this means is if you are black and you are nominated for Best Actor, you have a much better chance of winning than if you are white and you're nominated for Best Actor. Doesn't sound like there's a bunch of racists over there at the Academy for Motion Pictures. 18.75% of the Best Actors awards have gone to African Americans in the last 16 years. Now, what about Hispanics? Well, they got 3.75% of the nominations and 0% of the Oscars. Asians... They got 1.25% of the nominations. Again, if you count Ben Kingsley as Asian. If you don't, then they got zero. And they won 0% of the Oscars for Best Actor. So 
No Asians have won Best Actor in the last 16 years. No Hispanics, but 18.75% of the Academy Awards went to blacks. Now, what about Best Actress? Well, uh, black women got 5% of the nominations and 6.25% of the Oscars. So again, those black women who were nominated, they did have a, uh, a better chance of getting an, uh, uh, winning than a, a white nominee. Again, Hispanics, 3.87% of the nominations, zero Oscars. Asians, 0% of the nominations, and of course, zero Oscars. So, I mean, here, Best, best Supporting Actor. Blacks got 7.5% of the nominations, and they won six and a quarter percent of the Oscars. Hispanics, uh, they got 3.7% of the nominations in Best Supporting Actor, but they got 12.5% of the Academy Awards. Asians got 3.75% of the nominations. Again, if you count Ben Kingsley, he was the only nominee, and they won 0% of the awards. For actresses, Blacks got 11.25% of the nominations. They won 25, 25% of the Oscars. This is Best Supporting Actress. Black women, 25% of the Academy Awards, 11.25% of the nominations. Again, they're only 12.2% of the population, Blacks. Hispanics was 3.75% of the nominations, 6.25% of the Oscars. Asians, 1.25% of the nominations. And Asians were 1.25% of the nominations, 0% of the Oscars. The total, right, if you combine all four of the acting categories, here's the grand total. Blacks got 9% of the nominations and received 14% of the Academy Awards. They got 14% of the Academy Awards since 2000. They are 12.2% of the population, 14% of the Academy Awards. Why are they protesting? How does that show racism? I mean, how much of a higher percentage do blacks think they need to win to prove that the Academy is not racist? Do they have to win half the awards? I mean, Hispanics, they got 4% of the nomination, despite the fact that they are 16% of the population. They got 4% of the nominations and received 4% of the Oscars. Asians, who are almost 5% of the American population, 4.7%, got 1.25% of the nominations and zero, zero Oscars uh, during that time period from 2000 to today. So where are the protests? Where are the Asians boycotting the Academy? Because obviously the Academy is uh, discriminating against Asians. I mean, it's clear, right, by the numbers, if you're just going to go by the disparate impact. But, you know, the reality is one of the reasons that black actors and actresses aren't even getting even more <laughs> Academy Awards than they've got, right? Think about the type of movies that get nominated. They're, they're dramas, right? These are not big blockbuster movies. The movies that get nominated for Best Picture are usually not the big you know, box office grossy movies. Sometimes they are, but usually they're not uh, because the big movies are generally action-adventure, sci-fi, comedy, and that's not where you get the, the awards for good acting, right? They're in dramatic roles. The black moviegoer, typically, not all of them, again, I mean, nothing is absolute for everybody, but by and large... The black ticket buyer, he's not that interested in The Revenant or Spotlight. In fact, they probably don't even, most black ticket theater never even heard of these movies. Not only did they not see them, they didn't even hear of them, right? Most of them, right? They like comedies and they like action movies, and that's where they are. They're going to see Ride Along 2, right? That's not going to get nominated. Uh, Kevin Hart's a funny guy, but he's not going to get Best Actor, you know, he's just not going to do it for the roles that he's playing. But that's why. I mean, Hollywood isn't racist. It's all about money, right? It's about what the people want to see. And the the black moviegoer wants a certain type of movie. And a lot of black actors and actresses get paid a lot of money to make the kind of movies that blacks want to see. Now, whites want to see comedies too. They want to see action adventure. But I think since whites are a much larger percentage of the population, and if you have a larger percentage of that population wanting to see dramas, and then that's where the movies are made, most of these dramas, the roles are mainly going to be white roles. Not to say there aren't roles where blacks are in dramas and where they're in these dramas and they do well, they get nominated and they win. 
And some of the highest grossing, I mean, look at Will Smith. I mean, he has been nominated in the past. Yes, he wasn't nominated last year, but he's been nominated for Academy Awards, right? But a lot of the stuff that he's in, these big budget movies that he wants to be in, where they pay him $20, $25 million, he's one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood, those type of movies that spend enough money to have Will Smith in them aren't usually the ones that get nominated for the Academy Award because the producers have to make enough money to pay Will Smith that huge salary. Right? If they want to do some kind of drama that doesn't have all the special effects and all the laughs, that's not going to appeal to a big audience, but is going to appeal to the Academy, that might be a role that you can get an Academy Award, you're not going to get paid $20 million to act in that movie. So I bet a guy like Mill Smith, when he looks at a lot of scripts, and let's say he looks at a script where there's a really dramatic role, and he's like, well, you know, if I take this role, maybe I can get myself an Academy Award, but their budget is only $3 million. No, thank you, because that conflicts with this mega hit that I'm going to do about space aliens invading the planet where I'm going to get paid $25 million, whatever he's doing. That's what he wants to do. And it's all about the money. The, the, the people in Hollywood are not racists. The Academy members are not racist. And why don't they stand up to all these black protesters with these facts? Are they afraid? Are they afraid to get called racist if they present any facts to people who are shouting racism? That's racist. Look, one you know, last thing I wanted to comment on while I'm on the subject of race. Look at what happened with the primary in South Carolina. Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton got 84% of the black vote, 84%. I mean, why? Why are all the black voters voting for Hillary Clinton? I mean, maybe it might have something to do with why so many black voters prefer the types of movies that they prefer. Look, if the typical black voter is very liberal, I would say that the typical black voter is more liberal than the typical white voter. And I would also say that the typical black Democrat is more liberal than the typical white Democrat. Meaning if you just gave a quiz and you asked certain questions, I bet that the typical black Democrat would score to the left of the typical white Democrat. Yet Bernie Sanders, who is to the left of Hillary Clinton, is getting no support in the black community. Why is that? I bet if you just took these voters who are voting black voters who are voting for Hillary Clinton, and you described what uh, Bernie Sanders is in favor of, his positions, and didn't say, you know, which was the candidate, and then you described Hillary Clinton's positions, didn't say who it was, and said, pick the candidate. They, they, overwhelmingly, they would go for Bernie Sanders. Overwhelmingly. Yet, they're not. Why aren't they doing that? I mean, this, this, he, is, he is promising exactly what they want. I mean, if Bernie Sanders were black, he'd have all their votes. He would be kicking Hillary Clinton's butt if, you know, if it was Jesse Jackson versus uh, Hillary Clinton or somebody else. But no, he's an old Jewish guy uh, from the Northeast. That might probably be part of it. But another part of it might be they don't even know who he is, just like they don't know about The Revenant or they don't know about Spotlight. They probably don't even know who he is. They're probably they, you know, they haven't even done any research. They haven't looked into the issues. They're just voting for something that's familiar, something they know, and something that everybody else is doing. But is it racist that Hillary Clinton got 84% of the black vote? Right? Is that I mean, Bernie Sanders isn't isn't claiming that it's anti-Semitism, although that might be part of it, but he's not he's not saying that. Is it possible that there's more anti-Semitism in the black community than there is in the white community? I mean, certainly Bernie Sanders has a better reason to claim that blacks are being anti-Semitic based on 84% of the votes going to an opponent who is to his right. When the blacks who are voting are far to the left, he probably has a better argument to say anti-Semitism than the blacks who are protesting that they didn't get nominated for enough Academy Awards, claiming that the, the whites or, you know, or the blacks for that matter, whoever who's at the Academy, that they are, are racist. Because the evidence shows the exact opposite. They have plenty of Academy Award nominations. They have plenty of victories in percentage to where they are in the population. Now, of course, I'm not exactly sure how the percentage that blacks are in the population 
what their exact percentage is of the actors and actresses because it, it might not be exact. I mean, so there, it's possible that, you know, maybe that the, the pool of, of actors and actresses skews a little bit more or a little bit less. I'm not exactly sure where that is, but I'm sure it's not that far off the actual, the actual percentage. Anyway, we'll see what happens tomorrow. We get Super Tuesday. And of course, Donald Trump is uh, expected to do extremely well in those primaries. And of course, the Republican establishment really doesn't know what to do because it looks like uh, Donald Trump is going to steamroll through this process. Hillary Clinton probably has it sold up thanks to the minority vote. She's going to lose the white vote, but she is going to win overwhelmingly the minority vote, particularly African-Americans. They, you know, they're, they're just going to continue to pull the lever for Hillary Clinton because they know her, right? She was married to the first black president, which was uh, her husband, Bill Clinton. So it's likely going to be Hillary versus um, Donald Trump. And again, the only reason, the only reason that it's not going to be Donald Trump versus Sanders is because of the black vote. But the white community is going for Sanders for the same reason the Republicans are going for Trump. And I've said this before. It's because Warren Buffett is wrong and the president is wrong. They're not peddling fiction. When they talk about how bad the U.S. economy is, when they talk about how the economy is in decline and how our standard of living is going down and how we need a change, they're right. Bernie Sanders is right about that. We need a change. Things are getting bad. And Donald Trump is right. America isn't great anymore. We need to make it great again. Warren Buffett and the president are wrong. And that's why these two candidates are so popular. And I believe that Bernie Sanders would be much more popular with the uh, African-American community if he wasn't an old Jew from the Northeast or if the African-Americans who are voting in mass for Hillary Clinton actually took the time to study the issues, because I believe if they actually knew what Bernie Sanders wanted to do, they would vote for him. Not because I think he's the better candidate, but I think he more accurately represents what they want. Plus, look at Bernie Sanders. He was arrested at civil rights marches. He was marching. He went to jail you know, in the 1960s, marching in favor of civil rights. I mean, what was Hillary Clinton doing back then when he was in a jail cell, you know, marching with, you know, uh, for, for civil rights? I mean, this guy eats and, and, and breathes everything that these African-American Democratic voters say they want. He's their ideal candidate based on what they want. And he's a genuine guy. He's a sincere guy. Hillary is a crook. I mean, she'll say whatever she has to say. Who knows what she actually believes? And she's, of course, she's in bed with Wall Street. I mean, voting for Hillary Clinton is like voting for Goldman Sachs. Yet 84% of the African-American vote went to Hillary Clinton. So and that's and they're the ones that are going to keep him from the nomination because of that. So bottom line, if it wasn't for the African-American vote going overwhelmingly for a candidate that really shouldn't be getting their vote, it would be... Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump. And it's only because the country is, un is in such horrible shape that America is desperate for anything different because they know the one thing that's not going to work is more of the same. So they want to vote for the most different candidate they can find, and that is Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free.
I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advised clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold videocast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold videocast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.